Today I'm going to talk specifically about the first persona, DNS as a facilitator, DNS acting as a naive resolver, and how malware or botnet command and control or phishing leverages DNS doing its job in order to connect to backend services that are important for that specific breach. Clients, as we know, in order to connect to any sort of backend server, go through DNS. DNS is basically the address book for the internet. They'll return, DNS will return an IP address of that backend service. In today's day and age, with cloud scale applications, oftentimes it may return one or many IP addresses. Those IP addresses may be for services that are distributed globally. It might be different IP addresses based on the health of a specific service. But it's an important, a critical part of how DNS works in order to abstract the application and its network address from the actual domain. DNS rel relies on registrars and registration in order to uh, make that domain publicly available. And there's a great deal of information that can be used when we look at things like malware and botnet and phishing to try to figure out if these domains are um, represent a threat or any sort of compromise. The most obvious way is it's known. There is a blacklist. There is threat intelligence. We know there's something wrong with that domain. We can easily block it. What gets really difficult is this gray area. We don't know if this thing is good or bad, and what can we do when there's actually a compromise to assess that domain quickly to figure out if there's risk associated with that domain. Now let's talk about what happens when a client is actually compromised. Um, and let's say this is a case of malware that is exfiltrating data. That malware needs to exfiltrate data somewhere, and that somewhere, in many cases, will be distributed locations around the world or distributed locations for resilience, much the same way that Microsoft engineers Office 365 so that there's multiple locations where this compute is running. Those engineering these malware systems um, need to make sure that their backends are distributed to create resilience, to create scalability, and to make sure that there's not a single point of failure where, for instance, if I took out this part of the backend malware server, I can shut the whole thing down. Therefore, DNS becomes a critical part of this communication, just like it is if somebody's going to Office 365. DNS provides that abstraction layer so that um, I can move this service around. I can return one to many IP addresses over time. So the clients can ask a question. DNS knows where the information is the client's asking. Where is that IP address? It also knows who. Who am I asking? What information do I know about this domain? And then, of course, we get the answer, and the answer will be the IP addresses, for instance, of the backend service to connect to. There's what we're asking, there's who we're asking, and there's the actual answer. All three of these areas are critical when we try to assess very quickly, if we don't know this thing is already bad, if it's gray, as we try to assess that quickly, we need to understand all of that information. So what's the question? In this case, the question is simply look up a domain. I'm going to go and look up an A record, for instance. I want to know the IP address of this backend service, and that malware is going to look up that domain. The domain itself uh, has lots of clues if this thing is good or bad. Um, you know, we know based on a lot of research, uh, based on, for instance, the length of those domains, the number of unique characters of those domains, there's all sorts of things that can be looked at for at the domain name itself without any, anything else to try to assess if, if it looks suspicious or not. Who are we asking? The way DNS works, um, you know, there is a registrar, and that registrar collects all sorts of information about that domain owner. Uh, is this domain registered to an individual? Where is this individual? Is the address listed even an actual address? Uh, is it registered anonymously? Is it registered to a corporation and a corporation that we trust? Who is the registrar itself? Some registrars have phenomenal reputations. Other registrars 
seem to exist to facilitate the bad guys. So who is that registrar itself? And of course, um, we'll know through this registration process where the actual DNS server is. What is the address of that DNS server? This contract's very important to understand who are we asking. And based on those sorts of clues, we can assess again if there's risk there. And then there's the answer. What is the IP address that was returned? Is that IP address associated with other malware, other things that we might know about that might be bad? Is that IP address changing quite often? You'll see with, with services that you trust, for instance, like Office 365 or Salesforce, those IP addresses will change. And again, they'll change because these companies are building highly scalable, geographically distributed services. But how often are they changing? And if it's something we really don't trust, and the answer's changing all the time, it's very suspicious and certainly something we want to look at. This idea of fluxing of this answer. It gets, there's more complex things we can look at in all three of these areas. You know, for instance, the DNS server itself has an IP address. The DNS server might be moving around. That's sort of odd. I mean, it, it's very odd. It certainly happens for good purposes. DNS servers move. There's multiple IP addresses this DNS server might be on uh, simply for scalability and resilience. But if this is fluxing, if we're getting changing of where this is quite often, um, it's certainly evidence of somebody trying to keep this DNS server mobile so that um, it can't be shut down or it can't be blocked. So again, whether it's what are we asking, who are we asking, or what the actual answer is, there's all sorts of evidence for us to assess when we try to understand if we don't know something, is this thing good or bad? Should we be blocking it? And based on the risk tolerance of um, enterprises, uh, they might set that gauge higher or lower. There are many, many, many thousands and thousands of new domains that show up every single day. Um, it's unclear what the backend service is or if the backend service even exists for these domains. They're just new, new domains in, in DNS. And as they're actually queried, it's a perfect time to assess. So that's DNS as a facilitator, simply doing its job to abstract the actual address of backend services from a domain name for scalability, resilience, and uh, load balancing.